the church of the Laodiceans, and we did read Colossians chapter 2 for a reason. Um, actually, if you want to sort of get an idea what the church in Laodicea was like, probably the best example of, of what it was like prior to the writing of, of, of Christ against in the book of Revelation is probably found in the book of Colossians. Probably the closest church you're going to find that's very similar to um, the church in Laodicea. And I'll show you that in a minute, but keep your finger there in Colossians chapter 2. And go to Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3. And uh, so this is the, the, the final, the seventh church in, in the book of Revelation. And then it says here in verse number 14, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. All right, so... If you just quickly flick back to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, look at verse number 1, Colossians chapter 2, verse number 1. Uh, now, Paul had not visited, never, you know, uh, never physically visited the Colossian church, but he wrote this letter, and he says there in verse number 1, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. He goes, look, the Laodicean church, the Colossian church, you guys know about me. I've written to you. This is a letter for you, but you've not seen me in the flesh. And you see that the Apostle Paul has a great love. He says he's got a great conflict that he has for them. Even though he's never seen them, he's heard of their reputation. In fact, one of the church leaders, maybe the pastor, I forget his name right now, was in prison with Paul during this time. There's no doubt that this pastor or, or this leader of the church, you know, um, uh, updated Paul with the progress of the church in, in, in Colossians, and he heard about the Laodicean church as well. Go to Colossians chapter 4 now. Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says, so of course this is the, the, uh, the epistle to the Colossian church, but this is what he says to the Colossian church. This is the instruction, verse number 16, Colossians 4, 16. And when this epistle is read among you, Cause it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, that ye, uh, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Okay, so you see that Paul has written to the uh, Colossian church. He goes, once you're done reading it, once you're done preaching and learning from it, now send it to the church in Laodicea so they can learn from that as well. And we find out here that he also sent an epistle to Laodicea, to the church there. And, you know, their instruction was to send it to the Colossian church. And of course, you know, that epistle is not in, in the canon of our scripture, okay? I mean, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of writings, there's also letters that are not part of the canon of scripture. And so, of course, this, this is not a letter that God saw fit to, to keep, um, a, 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 you know, as part of the canon of scripture. You know, you know potentially, there's probably many reasons for that. Potentially, it's not fully under the influence of the Holy Ghost, or maybe it's just very similar to the one that's given to the Colossian church. And so these letters are being shared around. And so that gives you kind of an idea about the situation of the church in Laodicea. You know, Paul cares very much for the church. He sends instructions to the church. And one of the key themes in the book of Colossians is, you know, not to be distracted and not to follow after the ways of the world. You know, to keep your hearts and minds on, on Jesus Christ and, 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 and to, you know, think about eternity and not to think about the temporal things. You'll see that when you read the book of Colossians. That's, that's a major theme that you'll find there in that book. And so it kind of makes sense as we go through uh, the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation that they've not taken heed to the instruction of Paul. They, in fact, they have gone after the ways of the world. You know, they, have, they haven't set their sights on eternal matters. They've set their sights on earthly things. And in fact, out of all the seven churches that we read about in Revelation, the church of Laodicea, Jesus Christ says n not one positive thing about them. You know, you could say it's the worst church. Now, I don't know if it's the worst church. There's been some pretty bad churches as we've gone through that list. But Jesus points to nothing positive about them. Everything that he says about the Laodicean church is seen in a negative light. Now, if you guys go back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse number th uh, 13, we again see the introduction of Jesus Christ. And he, 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 he calls himself, these things safe the amen. Now, what does it mean to say amen? When we, when we pray together, we often end with amen. Someone prays, maybe the rest of us. If we're in agreement with that prayer, we would say amen. What amen basically means is that's the truth. I agree with that. And so when someone prays, if you agree with that prayer, 
it's good practice for you to say amen as well, if you agree with the prayer. You know, and as someone preaches behind the pulpit and you hear them preaching the truth of God's word, if you agree with that, you know, you should say amen. All right. Amen means that's the truth. I'm in agreement with that truth. And Jesus Christ basically says, look, I'm the amen. I'm the truth. Okay. And then again, he clarifies this, the faithful and true witness. Okay. Speaking of himself. But again, if you, if you hear a true witness being preached behind the pulpit, say amen, right? And then he says that he is the beginning of the creation of God. And there are those that do not believe in the deity of Christ. They do not believe that Christ is the Lord God. And they say, well, he's just a creation of God. And they'll take this verse here in verse number 14 and say, look, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Meaning that the first thing God created, the beginning of his creation, right, was Jesus Christ. The very first thing that God created was Jesus Christ. And you can see how they can take that. And of course, those that are anti-Christ, those that are against Christ, will take anything they see in the scripture and try to, you know, turn people's hearts against the Lord God. But that's not what Christ says at all. If you guys go back to Colossians, I should have told you to keep a finger there. Go back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 the Bible reads, for by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, for by him or by Jesus were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Jesus Christ created all things, not just that's what, what, what is on the earth, but that also which is in heaven and that, and that are in earth, visible and invisible. You know, there's an invisible world out there. You know, we talk about the, you know, the spiritual realm and we don't see the angels necessarily. You know, we don't see you know, the, the devils and those kinds of influences, but it's out there. It's an invisible world. But then you've also got the microscopic world, you know, tiny creatures you can't even see with your naked eye. You know, the, the, the elements that make up everything in the world, these things are invisible. And we to, we're told here that Christ created the visible and the invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Verse number 17 and He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. So this explains to us what it means in Revelation 3.14 for Christ to be the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 17 says, why? Because He is before all things. Okay, And of Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. In other words, besides you know, going outside, trying to find before the beginning, trying to find after the ending, there's no such thing. All you're going to find is God. You know, God is, is the one that can see, you know, all things create, uh, exist because of Him. All things consist because of Him. And so Christ is the beginning, meaning He's, he's the starting point of everything that was created. And that's what's being affirmed for us there in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Back to, back to Revelation. We will go back to Colossians later on. So if you want to keep a finger there, you can. But Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Jesus says to this church and Look, this church was doing some works, all right? But he doesn't, he doesn't compliment the works. He says, I know that thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, so the works that they do is lukewarm, right? Because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I mean, that's the works of this church. He says, look, I'd just rather spew you out of my mouth. You know, the, the way this church was, I mean, what, what, what horrible words, right? I mean, for, you know, could you imagine that Christ would say that about New Life Baptist Church? How ashamed would I be as a pastor? I hope you would be ashamed as church members as well, you know, for Christ to have to say things like that. Hey, but we should take heed, listen, learn. Let's never be that church. Let's never be, be that lukewarm church that Christ wants to spew. Now, I'm going to give you my um, interpretation or my understanding of what we just read. And it's probably not going to be familiar to what you guys probably thought about as you've read through these two verses, verses 15 and 16. What I've commonly heard taught is basically a few things here. Look at, number, look at verse 15 again. He says that thou art neither cold nor hot. And what are they instead? They're lukewarm. So the common teaching out there is that if the church was hot that would be a good thing. And I agree with that. Okay, I agree with that. 
And the next thing is, well, because this church is lukewarm, that's a bad thing. And again, I agree with that. Of course, lukewarm, you're going to be spewed out of the mouth. But then what I've also heard taught is basically, well, if you're a cold church, that's also bad. And that's where I disagree. All right? And I know that's probably the first thing you think about when you, when you read these things. And you go, well, cold must be bad. Lukewarm must be bad. You know, God must be saying, hey, you need to be aiming to be that hot church. And I basically heard preaching like this. Let's aim to be, you know, a hot, zealous, on fire church for God. And I'm all in favor of those things. But I think we're, we're missing the points as to what Christ is speaking about here. Okay. Now, look, if, if, the, if there are only two options, if the option was basically cold or hot, then, yeah, I can understand that, that God is calling for them to be hot. But he says there in verse number 15, I would thou wert cold or hot. He says, look, I would rather you be just cold or rather you be hot. Now, you say, well, can you explain that? Like, basically, people will just come up with what they believe that's talking about, okay, without actually seeing what the Word of God says, without extracting something from the Word of God from the Scriptures to determine what does it mean to be cold, what does it mean to be hot. And if we take what Christ is speaking about, especially in verse number 16, it becomes apparent what He's talking about. It's about something, you know, figurative speaking that has entered into His mouth. Because that's why he wants to spew out the lukewarm church. You know, he's speaking about a drink. He would rather this church be a hot drink or a cold drink, but not that lukewarm drink. And, you know, you guys, you know, you got your coffee drinkers. You love your hot drink, right? You, th- th- there's a time for the hot drink. There's a time, you know, maybe you're cold and you need to be warmed up and you, you have that, that hot drink. You know, it, it brings warmth into your body. But, you know, the Bible also speaks well in positive light of a cold drink. You know, sometimes, I'll, I'll give you some references so you don't need to turn there just very quickly. Proverbs 25, 25, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Cold waters to a thirsty soul. And Matthew 10, 42, Jesus Christ says these words, and whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of, the, of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward, okay? So we see in the Bible when we're talking about cold drinks, it's actually seen in a positive sense, okay? And my, my, the point is this. Sometimes you need a hot drink, okay, for the warmth, you know, to be on fire, you know, that kind of thing, right? Some people love the drink so hot. My mother-in-law loves it basically boiling straight off a kettle, drink it just like that, right? She loves it boiling hot. And some, some others, when you're thirsty, when you need to be refreshed, what are you looking? You're not looking for the hot drink when you're thirsty, are you? You're looking for that cold water. You're looking for that refreshing, nourishing water that you're going to drink. And the lesson that I take out of this, when we look at the different churches in the book of Revelation, they're all different. They're all doing, they've all got different measures of works. They're all di- doing different things. You know, Christ sees them as, as, as uh, independent churches, you know, on their, on their own path, at different places on their path. And we see a variety of them. They're not all hot. In fact, the majority here are not hot, you know, but Christ is able to still see some pleasant things in many of these churches. And so what, what I believe is happening here is Christ says, look, I'd rather you just be that hot drink, a cold drink. At least you're useful for the purpose, all right, because there are different types of churches. But what I don't want you to be is that lukewarm drink where you're neither hot nor cold. You say, what, what does it mean to be a lukewarm uh, uh, church then? Well, have a look at verse number 17 because he clarifies to us, he explains to us what it means to be lukewarm. In verse number 17, because, right, you're lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So this church is rich. They've actually got possessions. They're doing quite well financially, right? They have goods. They say, hey, look, we've got so many things here. We're able to run church. We're not really, you know, needing to call upon the Lord to provide us our needs because we're we're well taken care of. And they saw their material wealth. They saw their possessions as a sign that they were a great church, that they were a good church, all right? But Christ says, no, actually, the truth about you is that you're wretched, You're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. In other words, this church was lukewarm because they had no self-awareness, all right? They're in a bad state spiritually, and they don't even know it. 
They're in a bad state spiritually, but they're looking at the physical wealth they have. They're maybe looking at their nice building. Maybe they're looking at they've got all the Bibles and the tracts and all the fancy things in the church going on. They've got all the different activities going on, but they're lacking the awareness. They're not doing anything for the Lord. The Lord has nothing positive to say about this church. I don't want to be like that. You know, I'd rather be a poor, a church that is uh, uh, poor with possessions, but spiritually rich, rich in Christ. You know, I, you know, it's a blessing to have this church building, isn't it? But if we didn't have the church building and we had to meet in a park somewhere, hey, we could still be a rich church. We still could be a, a, a doing uh, great works for the Lord. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, read quickly from Romans 7.23. Romans uh, 7, 23, because he says about this church that they are wretched. And the only other time in the Bible that it mentions wretchedness is in Romans 7, 23. I think it goes well with what we're seeing here in this church. Uh, Paul says about himself, this is the battle between the, the flesh and the spirit, the new man and the old man. He says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Of course, the battle, right? The battle between the flesh and the spirit. And then in verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So Paul calls himself wretched, right? When he realizes, man, I want to serve the Lord. I want to do what's right, but I'm giving in to the flesh. I'm giving in to the power of sin. Why am I doing that? And he calls, I'm wretched because of that. And that, that is what I believe is happening with this church. Maybe they want to do what's right. You know, it sounds like, like Paul, that they're desiring to do what's right, but they keep doing that which is wrong. They keep, doing, they keep giving in to the, to the flesh. They keep giving in to, you know, the worldly desires. And maybe they want to make a name for themselves in the world rather than a name for themselves before the Lord. And so the Lord in verse number 18 instructs them, right? He instructs them. And by, by the way, it says wretched in verse number 17. Let's not, sorry, let's not go to 18 verse yet. It's verse 17. Wretched, they're miserable. Hey, I've seen that in churches. I've seen churches that, you know, have a hundred or some people, you know, with, with a lot of material possessions and people are miserable. Miserable. You know, I, I'd rather, you know, I, I want to be in church because I want to be encouraged. I want, to, I want to go to church to edify the brethren. I want to go to church to be edified by the brethren, to receive a blessing. But sometimes you go to church and you're miserable, okay? And that's a bad place to be. You know, if you come to church and you feel miserable, then there's something wrong. Maybe with the church, maybe there's something wrong with your spiritual life, you know? And I just found the best way to overcome misery and sadness and depression is just to care about others. You know what? I'm miserable, but I'm going to make someone else's life better. You know, I'm going to bless someone else. And again, by doing that, by serving, by loving the brevity, it lifts your spirits, you know? And then it says, and poor. And of course, God doesn't care about material wealth, right? They're poor. But when he says you're poor, he's saying, look, you're not laying up treasures in heaven. You know, you're not rich in my sight. You're not laying up, you know, the, the riches for all eternity. Yes, you've got possessions on the earth. You say you have no need of anything, but you're not going to be able to take that to heaven. We're not going to be able to take these chairs to heaven or the air conditioner to heaven or the sound system to heaven. It's nice to have these things. But our focus should be to be laying up treasures on high. And then he says, you're blind and you're naked. We'll have a look at that soon. Look at verse number 18. So God, uh, Jesus Christ provides them counsel. He says, look, this is what you need to do, church. From, you, you know, you're a lukewarm church. This is what it means to be lukewarm. You think you're doing well, but you're doing poorly. That's what it means to be lukewarm as far as the context within this chapter. In verse number 18, I counsel thee. So this is the advice that Christ gives. And, and I love it because Christ has always given these churches time. He's always been long-suffering. He's always been merciful. He's always given them the opportunity to improve. And he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. It sounds like this church has not been going to Christ. It looks like they've been trying to purchase other things through some other avenues, but haven't been going to Christ for their needs. You know, this is why I love our Wednesday services, because we have a time where we can buy from Jesus Christ. We go, Jesus, please help us. It's time for prayer. Let's pray in Jesus' name. We have these requests. We have these needs. Lord, please provide, you know, for this church. So it sounds like they haven't even been going to Christ for their needs. So look, come, I can't say, buy of me gold tried in the fire. Hey, start laying up treasures in heaven once again. 
that thou mayest be rich. They still had time to be rich in heaven, right? They weren't doing too well as a church, but they have time. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment. Now, just stop there for a minute. Oh, sorry. White raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now, I've heard some people say that the church in Laodicea uh, was not a saved church. You know, that they, they wasn't made up of true Bible-believing Christians. And so when Christ says, hey, you know, buy a white raiment, they're basically saying, hey, you know, they weren't saved, they, they weren't, you know, they hadn't received the imputed righteousness of, of Christ. And I mean, that's nonsense. Well, really, when we started this series uh, on the seven churches, we saw that these, each church represented one of those seven candlesticks of Christ, okay? So it's definitely already a church that belongs to Christ, okay? And then when it comes to the white raiment, what's good about the Bible, many times, you know, we just go back a little bit and we have the answer. And just as a, re a, re a refresher, go back in the same chapter there, look at verse number four, when we were looking at the church in Sardis, remember what we saw there in Revelation chapter three, verse four? We saw, we saw two garments, two white garments. One represented the white garment of salvation, for, that, for the one who had overcome, you know, the, the imputed righteousness of Christ. But another garment represented our walk with the Lord, which can be spotted by this world. Just as a refresher there, verse number four, uh, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So we see a walk with the Lord, you know, how we should live with Christ, and we have these garments, and we need to make sure those garments remain undefiled, that they remain unspotted. And when we commit sin, of course, it becomes spotted, it becomes defiled. That's why we need to go to the Lord, confess those sins, you know, and, and you know, ask the Lord to, to, to maintain that clean walk with Him. And then verse number five, in the same, for the same church, He that overcometh, we know that's someone that's saved, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's the white raiment's cloak, right? And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And so if we have that already, we've already learned that as we're reading through the book of Revelation, that there's, there's two garments, the one that we're clothed with when we're overcome, and then we have a garment which is, gets defiled as we walk after sin, after the flesh. Then which garment do you think is being referred to for the church in Laodiceans there in verse number 18? It says, look, and white raiment, you know, buy the white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, okay? It's basically, this is the walk, okay? They're already saved. So this is, this is you know, you've got, you know, right now it's saying, you look, you're naked. I mean, not only are your, are your garments defiled, not only are they spotted by the world, you're not even wearing them, all right? I mean, these guys are not in a good place spiritually with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he can't even give them a, a good, you know, any kind of good news, about the church, not even walking with the Lord, all right? And this is why, hey, look, get your garment back on, come and buy it from me, come back to me, confess those sins, get right, start laying up treasure in heaven, and, you know, start walking, you know, in the Spirit, start walking after my ways once again, because, the, the, you know, the shame of your nakedness is, is, is appearing, basically. You know, everyone in heaven, in Jesus Christ, when they look at that church in Laodicea at this point in time, they're, man, look, they're naked. You know, they need to put on some clothes, you know, and the same truth is, you know, that, you know, soon I'll be preaching on nakedness and modesty and clothing standards. And, you know, we need to make sure that we dress appropriately, that we cover our nakedness. It's a shame. You know, Jesus Christ says about this church, it's a shame that you're, you're not clothed properly, that you're showing your nakedness. We need to make sure we do the same thing with our physical appearance. And then he says there in verse 18, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve. Basically, that's an eye solution. You become blinded. You can't see clearly. You know, uh, that thou mayest see. And um, if you guys just go back to, to um, Colossians chapter 2, if you kept your finger there, Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. Well, actually verse number 6, you know that that book was also uh, supposed to be read by the Laodicean church. And look at verse number 6, Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Again, in the instructions to Colossians, the instructions to the Laodiceans, walk in Christ. Paul is, is, you know, encouraging them to do that. Verse number seven, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Why? Verse number eight, lest, uh, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Look at this. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world 
and not after Christ. Paul warned him, this is going to happen to you if you don't walk after Jesus Christ. You don't walk in His ways. And as we get several years later, we see the book, you know, in the book of Revelation, the church in Laodicea, they did not take heed. They, they didn't obey what Paul had, you know, um, advised them to do, to walk for the Lord. And it sounds like to me that they were spoilt by philosophy and vain deceit, that they went after the tradition of men. They've gone after the rudiments of the world. They've become a worldly church, you know, deceiving themselves, looking at their, their material wealth as a sign of righteousness, but they had not gone after Christ. Okay, and you'll soon see that Christ is not even, well, we'll see, we'll see, but he's not even fellowshipping with them whatsoever. That's why they're completely naked, all right? And uh, we talked about the, the blindness, remember that they, they needed to buy the eye soul so they can see once again. And just very quickly, Second Peter chapter 1 verse 9, I'll just read it to you. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 9, um, it says here, but he that lacketh these things, actually, can you turn there? Second Peter chapter 1 verse 9, turn there. Because I've got a few verses there that I want you to look at. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible reads, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So you see how Peter warns about those that are saved, Okay, they've been purged from their, from their old sins, but they're currently blind. Why? Because they're lacking certain things, and, and what they lack has caused them to go blind. Let's see what these things are. Just drop, look back up in verse number 5, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. These are the things that, that are lacking, and you go blind when you're lacking these things. Verse number 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly ki kindness, charity. What does this sound like to you? We've gone through the fruits of the Spirit. It's, it's pretty much identical. Not, not exactly, but pretty much those are the fruits of the Spirit that we've gone through before in our previous series, okay? So what was, what were the, what, what, you know, what is it that turns a church blind or turns somebody blind when then they don't have the fruits of the Spirit? Once again, the spiritual walk, they're not walking after the Spirit and they don't have these fruits in their life. Look at verse number 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're walking after the Spirit, you've got these fruits that are producing in your life then you're going to abound in the work that God has given you to do. But when you're not walking in the Spirit, when you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to, to uh, fix these things in your life, to, to help you overcome the flesh, you know, you're not producing this in your life, then that's when you become blind. Okay, you become blind. And so we take it back to Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church. Why have they gone blind? Because they're not even producing the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, they're no longer even walking in the Spirit. They don't even have the garments on. All right, Jesus says, look, come to me, buy from me these things. You need it all over again, not to be saved, but in order for them to have a fulfilled, productive Christian life, a productive Christian church. So you can see how this church is just failing all over the place on many levels, you know. And as I said, you'll notice that they don't, they don't even have Christ in the midst of their church. And uh, go back to Revelation chapter 3 now, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Now, verse number 19 proves once again that they are saved, okay? Because it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. All right? He says, look, be zealous. Get your zeal back, all right? Start walking with me again. Start producing the fruits of the Spirit. Start doing the works, all right? But look, he says, look, I'm going to chasten you. I'm rebuking you, and I'm going to chasten you. Why? Verse number 19, because I love you. But, but as many as I love, I'm going, to do, I'm going to do this because I love you, church. I died for you, you know. You, you, you're one of these candlesticks. I don't want you to, to be removed, and I love you, so therefore I'm going to chasten you because you're doing wrong. And expect that from the Lord when you're not walking after His ways, when you're being blinded when you're not 
uh, when you don't cover your nakedness spiritually, when you're not laying up treasures in heaven, God says to you, I love you, church. I, I, I love you, brother. I love you, sister, so-and-so. But I'm going to have to rebuke you, right? And the best chapter on, on chastisement is Hebrews chapter 12. So let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. And parents, why should we chastise our children? Number one, because we should love our children, right? Getting that rod out and, and correcting them, you know, we need, that's a sign of love. Because we don't want them to go down a bad road. We want them to correct the things they're doing wrong. When they're fussy eaters, we need to correct them. When they're disobedient to parents, we need to correct them. When we told them to do their schoolwork and they're doing something else, we need to correct them. We need to chastise them. We need to rebuke them. Why? Because you hate them? No, because you love them. All right? You need, you need to show love to your children. And Jesus Christ loves us. And he's going to chastise us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So look, the fact that the Lord wants to chasten the church in Laodicea means they are children of God. Okay? And if you're a child of God, expect the Lord to chastise you. All right? When you're doing wrong. I mean, I don't always know exactly when the Lord is chastising me. But when things go bad, when things aren't going according to plan, I kind of wonder... Is there something in my life? Is there an area of life where I'm really lacking? Is there an area of life that I dropped? Have I backslidden in some area of my life? Is the Lord bringing my attention? You know, is, does the Lord want to bring my attention to something that's missing in my life? Or could this just be something else? Is this just, you know... But that's the first thing you should be thinking about. When, when you're suffering, you know, some type of tribulation, some type of trial, ask yourself the question, have I dropped off, you know, an area in my spiritual walk with the Lord? And if you have it's probably the chastisement of the Lord that's come upon you. Verse number, uh, verse number 9, or verse number 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are, part, all are partakers, yes, even Pastor Kevin Sepulveda is a partaker of the chastisement of God. Whoever you think is the most righteous man on the earth today, the, most, the best Christian you can find today, or even the best Christians you find in the Bible, guess what? They were chastened by the Lord at some point. So you're in good company, right, when it happens, right? You're in good company. But verse number nine, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Look, this isn't, um, you know, dads, you know, you have a choice to discipline your kids or not. No, the Bible just makes it, look, expects you. It's just an expectation. Even, you know, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. It, it's just a given. Fathers, you're meant to discipline your children, you know, mothers, discipline your children. You know, don't wait for dad to come home and say, well, when dad comes home, you're going to get disciplined. Don't wait for that, mothers. Fix them straight away. Make sure you're in agreement with dad about the instruction. Make sure dad has, has uh, given you that, you know, um, has uh, delegated that task to you when he's away in the office, when he's away working, that moms can pick up that rod and discipline the kids. Make sure you're on the same page, okay, about discipline. Uh, Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. The Bible says, look, when you discipline your kids, they're going to give you reverence. They're going to give you honor. They're going to, oh, yeah, <laughs> better obey mom and dad next time, right? Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasteneth us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. And so what... what, what uh, what is being you know, taught to us here is when we're chastised by, by the Lord, it's so we can be a partaker of His holiness. We can continue to walk in His holy ways, and it's, it's for our profit. It profits us, okay? And it's always correct. Sometimes as parents, we could make mistakes with our discipline. You know, we, we might sometimes maybe discipline them or correct them when we may, probably shouldn't have. Or we don't discipline them when we should have had. You know, we, we can make those mistakes but when it comes to the chastisement of God, it's always right. It's always perfect. It's always the right measure of chastisement that He puts upon our lives. In verse number 11, Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised 
thereby. So one way for the Lord to bring forth fruit in your life, the fruit of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit, is for the Lord to put you in or under chastisement. Okay? We saw, hey, without those fruits, you're becoming blind as a Christian. All right? And the way God's going to make sure He opens your eyes, well, chastisement's going to come your way because He loves you. Okay? Because He loves you. Back to Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And this is probably the most upsetting part of all of this when we read about this church. Verse number 20. And verse number 20 has been many times been taken out of context. And that a lot of people use this as a verse about salvation. It sounds nice for salvation, you know, but it's not about salvation. Of course, this church is saved already. In fact, it's a scarier thing, right? Verse number 20. Behold, this is Jesus speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him or fellowship, you know, commune with him and he with me. Where was Jesus Christ at this church? He was outside the doors, all right? He says, look, I'm outside. Can you hear my voice? I'm knocking, right? Imagine coming to church, right? You come to church and, and Jesus, over, you know, Jesus over here. You know, you know, it's Jesus here, guys. Hey, let me in. I want a fellowship with you. Let me in. Can you hear me? They can't hear Jesus knocking. They don't hear the, his voice. All right. I mean, look how bad this church is. You know, they're coming together. Uh, you know, let's get, come together and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is out there. Right. Hey, let me in. All right. You're not walking with me. You're not fellowshipping with me. What a bad state for this church to be in. And, you know, he says, look, please, fix these about yourself. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to chastise you. I've been calling it out to you, and you're not letting me in. But if you hear me, you open up the door, I'm going to come back and fellowship with you once again. Man, that's a great guest to have. I reckon if you invited me to your house, say, be there at 6, you know, what time do we meet? 6.30. Be there at 6.30 p.m. And I'm outside knocking, hey, guys, I'm here. I'm here, and I'm there for half an hour. Guys, let me in. I'm going to be frustrated at you at some point, right? I'm going to get annoyed at you. Hey, you invited me. I've traveled the whole way here. I'm here to be with you. I want to be fellowship with you, but you won't let me in. And I love the mercy of Christ because it says, look, just open the door so we can fellowship, right? Just open the door, and it'll be all right once again. We can go back straight to fellowship. That's what I love about Jesus Christ. You know, he doesn't make you jump through hoops to reestablish a friendship. He says, look, just confess those sins, just take the punishment, just fix the things in your life, and we're back to, you know, being best friends. You know, we're back to being in fellowship. And just, you know, let that be a reminder to you, if you've been far from the Lord, if you haven't been walking with the Lord, just tonight. Tonight's the time to rekindle that fellowship with the Lord, okay? He wants to suck with you. He wants to be with you. And then verse number 21, what a promise he gives here. I almost feel like this church doesn't deserve it, but he says this, to him that overcometh, so the one that's saved, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Wow. We know that Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father, isn't he? He says, look, if you're saved, I'm actually going to let you sit with me on the throne. Wow, what an honor, right? On the throne of God, each one of us that are saved are going to have at some point some opportunity. I don't know how many of us will sit where to fit on that throne, but it sounds like these thrones are pretty big. Because then he says this, even at all, at, sorry, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in His throne. Okay? So we see that Jesus Christ sometimes will sit with the Father on the Father's throne. I mean, it's a, it's a big throne. Okay? And again, this just confirms the Trinity once again. All right? And I, I, I don't want to really go there, but during this whole oneness controversy, there was some issue about the throne. It's like, well, who's sitting on the throne here? At this point, it's Jesus Christ. And at this point, it's God the Father because the Lamb takes a scroll out of His right hand. Therefore, Jesus is the Father. Well, look, it just says here that Jesus can sit on the same throne with the Father. All right? I mean, the throne's big enough, and you can sit on Jesus' throne. You know? I don't know if we get to sit on the Father's throne. That'd be pretty cool. But hey, it's awesome that we'll be able to sit on the throne of Jesus Christ as well. What an honor. I mean, even this church that Christ can say no good thing about them says, well, at least you're saved. You'll sit on my throne. All right? You have that opportunity once you're in heaven. All right? But at this point in time, it's a poor church. It's a miserable church. And Christ wants them to fix themselves up. Verse number 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So let's take the lessons that we can 
from these churches. If you ever think, man, New Life Baptist Church, it's, you know, it's not that great of a church after all. Well, just read Revelation 2 and 3 again, all right? We're not too bad, all right? We're, we, we, but we need to make sure that we learn the lessons. Whatever things we're failing, whatever we're not doing better, uh, uh, good, we need to be doing better. Let's make sure we're not a church that is lukewarm. Now, I do want to end on, on one thing here. And I, I didn't want to cover it at the beginning. I didn't want to distract from the truth of God's word, words here. But I want to talk about dispensationalism a little bit, okay? The, uh, the, um, the teaching of dispensationalism. Now, I'm not a dispensationalist. This church is not a dispensational church, okay? And there's a lot of problems, okay, with the teaching. And I believe it causes people to be blinded, okay? We're talking about a church being blind. I believe dispensationalism can blind you from certain doctrines, certain truths from the Bible. And uh, one teaching within the dispensational framework is basic, or the, one of the key teachings is that there are basically seven dispensations of, of, or eras of time that God deals with people differently, okay? And for, like, for example, the first period of time they call the dispensation of innocence, and that would be the time of the, you know, the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were, you know, before they had eaten of the tree, of, of knowledge of good and evil, before they had done that, that's like the first dispensation. And then once God curses them and curses the earth, that's the next dispensation. I can't remember what they call that one. And then uh, the next dispensation is after the flood. And the next dispensation is with Abraham. And the next dispensation is with Moses. And the next, next dispensation is with uh, the New Testament church. So today they'll say, we are in the dispensation of grace. Or we're in the dispensation of the church age. Okay, and then they'll say at the rapture, there's a new dispensation of the tribulation. After that, there's a new dispensation of the millennium. And after the millennium, there's a new dispensation of the new heavens and the new earth, all eternity. Now, I, I kind of like the breakup they have in some of those areas. There, there are significant things that happen during those times. There is a shift of some sort, okay? But one thing that they, they sort of say, the reason God creates a new dispensation, basically they say this is, that the dispensation that God created with man, that men fail, and so God has to start a brand new dispensation. Because men keep failing, men keep failing. And so God has to start a new dispensation and do it all over again. All right? Think about how heretical this is, though. If we live in a church age right now, where Christ has died for the church, okay? So if this dispensation needs to, if, if we need a new dispensation in the future, what are they saying about this dispensation? That we're going to fail, right? That the church is going to fail. And it has to fail in order for the Lord to rapture the church. In a dis you know, they believe in a pre-tribulational rapture in order to bring the next dispensation of the uh, maybe tribulation or maybe they, they lump it together, tribulation with the millennium reign of Christ. And the reason I bring that up is, well, let, just keep that in mind for a minute. Keep that in mind that, the, you know, Apparently, according to this teaching, we're in the church age, okay? But they also teach that within the church age, there are seven ages within the church age, all right? And those seven church ages, what they teach is based on what we've learned through this series on Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. And they'll say each church, you know, even though they are physical churches, historical churches, They'll say each of these churches actually really represent a period of time within the church age. Okay? I hope you're following me. If, I, if it's gone over your head, maybe that's a good thing as well. Okay? Because it's kind of nonsense, all right? But I'm just trying to explain to you what they teach. So the first church that we saw was the church in F of Ephesus. And they'll say, well, that church represents, you know, and, and again, this isn't an exact thing. Different people teach it slightly differently. But they'll generally say this is from the time of Pentecost to about 100 AD, okay? So the church of Eph Ephesus represents the first century church, okay? Then I'd say the church in Smyrna represents the uh, you know, from 100 AD to about 300 AD, okay? And that period of time, the church was being persecuted by Rome, okay? And namely by uh, Nero, the Roman emperor. You know, you've heard the stories where Christians were gathered and into Colosseums and, and killed and things like that. Well, they say the church in Smyrna represents that church, all right? Or that, that period of time, I should say. Then the church in Pergamos, they'll say, represents the church from 300 AD to 800 AD. 
Now, just for a minute, I'm going to let you guys guess what church that could represent from 300 AD to 800 AD. And as soon as, look, when I got taught this, I was looking, oh, yeah, this sounds about right. And then when we got to the church in Pergamos, 300 to 800, I'm like, this is false. This is, this is stupid. Okay. I mean, even the ba- my Baptist brethren should know this is stupid. All right. What, what do you think this represents? I'd just like one of you guys guess if you know the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church apparently has been represented by the church in Pergamos. Look, these seven churches are churches of Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Church has nothing to do with Christ. Okay, they have another Christ. They have an antichrist. Their popes are, are their Christ. Okay, they have other gods, the saints and, and the Virgin Mary. She's not a virgin anymore. All right, she was a virgin when she gave birth, but she had other children. Up there. Look, they've got another Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church has nothing to do with a true church of Jesus Christ. And as I'm learning this, I'm like, man, that's cool. That's awesome. Wow, really? The Catholic Church? Baptist pastor? Come on, you know that's a false church. Are you, are you that blind with your teaching, with your doctrine and dispensation that you're going to teach your own church members this nonsense? That's, what, that's how I feel in my heart, but in my, in my, I was just smiling. Yeah. <laughs> and I passed the test, of course, you know. Anyway, let's keep going. Church in Thyatira, they say it's from 800 AD to 15, uh, 1517. 1517. And they'll say, well, that's the church in the Dark Ages. And then uh, the church in Sardis is from 1517 to about the 1700s, 1700. Now, I'll let you guys think, what could that represent? Why 1517? What's the significance of that date? Anyone know? Yeah, the Protestant Reformation, when uh, Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on the door of a, of a Catholic church. And I say, well, that church now, the church inside us represents, uh, you know, the Protestant movement, you know, um, that's come out of the Roman Catholic church. And once again, Baptist pastor, we're not Protestants. You know this, right? That's what made you a, a, a Baptist, okay? You, you, you said, hey, I identify as a Baptist. I've become a Baptist pastor because I don't identify with the Roman Catholics. I don't identify with the Protestants. I identify with believers that always held to certain distinctives, certain truths that we see in the Bible. They were always out there trying to get the gospel out being preached. They didn't care about being famous. They didn't care about, you know, uh, you know, writing books. They cared about getting the gospel. They cared about protecting the Bible, and they lost their lives. They even lost their lives uh, from Protestant people. Protestant leaders even put Baptists to death. And then the church in Philadelphia, the 1700 to the 1900, to 1900, 1700 to 1900, they say the church in Philadelphia was the great missionary days, you know, the and this is how they, they do, you know, the great missionary days that are past us now. You know, that's the past, you know. And then the, the church of the Laodiceans, because it's a pretty bad church, they say, well, that represents from the 1900s till today. Or really till the rapture is what they'll say. Till the end of the church age, which ends with the pre-tribulation rapture, when all the New Testament saints are being raptured out of here. Now, of course, we believe in the rapture, but we don't believe in the pre-trib rapture. And they'll say, well, see... That's what the church of Laodicea represents. And because the church of Laodicea, Jesus Christ has nothing positive to say about them. It's always negative. What it does, guys, they say, well, we're living in the Laodicean age, they say. You know, we're living in the lukewarm age. And so, look, could you, what would happen to a church if that's what the pastor's preaching to the congregation? Hey, man, we're just in the lukewarm age. We're in the Laodicean age. What are they saying then? Well, then Jesus Christ has nothing positive to say about your church? Jesus Christ is outside the doors of your church and he's not fellowshipping with you? Is that what you're saying? Because that's what you're saying when you're saying we're living in the Laodicean age. Hey, maybe they can be a Laodicean church. That's a problem. If you want to see yourself like that, hey, but this is not a Laodicean church, okay? Hey, I I want to be a great church. You know, I I want to learn from all these churches and see all the instructions that Christ has you know, laid out for each one of these churches. Say, hey, let's listen to all these instructions and make sure we put this in place for our church. Okay? Let's learn from all these churches, even the church in Laodicea. I mean, how bad is that? How discouraged? It's a defeated attitude to say, well, you know, Laodicea, and that's how it is. You know, it's been prophesied that we're going to be this way. That's a horrible thing. But here's the thing. You know, did Jesus say, well, Laodicean church, I guess you're just going to be like that. You know, no, he says, look, take counsel from me. 
Fix things, thing, you know, fix these things up. Instead of having a defeatist attitude, you know, look how the world's going, look how bad the church is going. Hey, take counsel from Jesus Christ if you think you're that way and do what's right. Jesus wasn't satisfied for you to stay that way. He wanted you to go to him, you know, you know lay up treasures in heaven, you know, put on some clothes, do some work, you know, take off your blinders, start seeing properly what the word of God says. Start walking after his ways. Hey, bring Jesus back into the church, will you? You know, let him back in so he can fellowship with you. That's what they should be doing if they think they're related to in church. But no, they've got a defeatist attitude. You know, the glory days, the great old days of the missionary, you know, back in the 1700s. Look, now's the time to get out there. Look, in the last days, the gospel of the kingdom, according to Jesus Christ, is being preached throughout all nations. That doesn't sound like a lady in church to me. It sounds like they're doing great works, you know, leading up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, just, just one last thing, which is kind of off topic. Well, it's already off topic. But they'll say, well, see, the Laodicean church age was from the 1900s, right? They'll say, till the rapture. Well, what happened to the imminent rapture? Because when they teach this, they say, well, during the church age, you had to go through all these hundreds of years that were represented by all these churches. So there was no pre-trib rapture, was there? There was no imminent rapture. According to their teaching, they teach as an imminent rapture. They teach it could happen at any time. From the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, any time from then, Jesus Christ could have come back. Well, hold on. That's against your teaching of the church ages. Because you're meant to go to the, at least to the 1900s, right? I mean, they defeat their own teachings. You know, with dispensationalism, it's nonsense. Guys, just pick up your Bible. Pray to Jesus Christ. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Father that he would reveal his word to you. And just take, look, was that complicated? We've gone through the seven churches. Was it really that complicated? Did we need to learn dispensationalism to really know what the churches were about? No. Okay? It's, it's perfect. It's beautiful. The words of God are there to encourage us. I'm encouraged when I see bad churches. I'm encouraged. Like, man, at least I'm not there yet, right? <laughs> and then, you know, I hope we don't get there. Let's learn from the lessons that we've seen from these other churches. And, you know, let's better ourselves as a church. Let's leave it there and pray.